Hello everyone, in today's video we're going to be taking a look at making an ultra-modern scenario. I imagine this is probably going to be a multi-part series on account of the fact that there's going to be a couple different steps, even not from the research phase. So I was thinking, okay, so we're going to do an ultra-modern scenario. So uh, first things first, I'm going to go ahead and set a date on this one. Generally, I don't like to make dates too, too close. And again, uh, your date here does matter, because if you want to think about setting a date uh, being in the future, you have to consider things like seasons. Now, what I wanted to do for a location for this particular place is going to be something about China and Vietnam getting in some kind of spat. Now, the interesting thing here is originally I was going to do a scenario involving, you know, something in the Marianas chain, you know, such as Guam here. But the problem with the scenario with that is it's it's going to be a little bit limited tactically. So I want to try to set something up where you have basically a limited war and you have a pretty solid engagement as well as, again, taking advantage of the terrain and some of the dynamics involved in it. So the first thing we need to do is we need to pick up the date that you saw me do just a moment ago. So the thing with the date is, is each one of these countries has unique weather patterns depending on what time of year that you're actually going to be setting the scenario. So for example, if I pop in here and I say, uh, let's say 2022, 2922, I uh, will say 08 and we'll say, um, oh, usually when you do these things, you wait for the middle of the month. Uh, obviously, whenever you have a scenario like this, you always want to start it pretty much as early in the morning as you probably can. We'll say 21, 23.30, press OK. And of course, 23.30 over on this side of things is going to be 6.30 local time, which is actually pretty common. So what we need to do now is we need to determine what the average weather of this particular season is going to be, as well as how long the scenario itself is. Now, in my mind, this is probably going to be that kind of uh, pre-scenario where you can have both naval as well as air elements trying to soften, uh, especially Vietnam, up as much as possible to basically allow the Chinese to seize what other assets exist here in the South China Sea. So uh, let's go ahead and take a look at a little bit of research here and see if we can find out what the weather is like in August. Ah, thank you, Google, for being so helpful. The Northeast Monsoon does not influence the South of Vietnam. Because of this reason, it only has two separate seasons, a dry season from November to April, and a rainy season, uh, rainy season rather, from May to October. So we are going to be in the rainy season. So now there's a couple different things we can think about. Obviously, uh, let's go pop over to weather real quick. Let's go set it to weather. Uh, average temperature in this particular part of the world is going to be staggering, even if it's now that time of day. I'd expect it to be at least 20 degrees Celsius in the morning. Our uh, rainfall rate, you're going to be getting some kind of patchy rain all the time, pretty much. Uh, Wind-wise, um, from what I've heard in this particular region, uh, the winds are not particularly excessive. If we wanted to find a more accurate way to do the wind, I'll show you a really cool trick. Again, uh, Vietnam is our friend here. I can see up here in Ho Chi Minh City that my temperature was actually fairly good. The low temperature, actually, I was too low. I need to bring it up another five degrees or so. Uh, one thing I did say, though, is that in August alone, you have 274 rainfall days, which means you're almost guaranteed to have some kind of wind here, which, like I said, is going to be kind of interesting. So we're definitely going to be getting wind. We're definitely going to be getting some rain in here. Now, let me show you another resource that I use typically for things like this. Aha, here we go. <laughs> this is uh, usually the old school resource for these kinds of things. And before you ask, uh, no, I will not provide you with this PDF. And yes, I own this book. It comes in a gigantic slug of paper. But uh, the reason I love this is um, this is, goes back to old school uh, tabletop war gaming here. But you can actually come in here and you can look up a specific region of the world. In this case, I'm interested in our uh, region 57 here. Then I can cruise down here to region 57. Again, you can see just how detailed this book is. People take this war gaming stuff too far sometimes, I swear. Ah, here we are. So let's see, we're in August. If uh, we were to roll a dice, if we roll between a 1, 140, uh, sorry, a 20, ooh, yep. So basically we have our wind direction, which is going to be southwest in this particular one. Our Beaufort number is going to be determined based on what number uh, we go ahead and roll here. So uh, if I roll between a 1 and a 43, that's going to suggest that my Beaufort is going to be between 1 and 3. If I do between 44 and 89, Beaufort 4 to 5. And of course, if I rate over 90, this is going to give me Beaufort 6 to 7. Uh, notice, by the way, there's a very low chance here. It's only a 2% out of the entire month of August that we could have a real storm here. So basically, we're going to have to come up with a random number here. Or if you're looking for a little bit more old school methods here, we can go ahead and just basically take an average, which suggests my Beaufort is going to be right around 4, which is actually a fairly significant significant amount of wind. So now with all that information that we've collected, and yes, I have a few naval games, let's go ahead and dial that in here. So we know that Beaufort's going to be sea state four, one, two, three, four, which is actually going to be fairly significantly nasty. Uh, the other thing we know is the sky itself is most likely going to be very cloudy, which is going to make things uh, very interesting for us here. Um, again, I'm probably going to have to adjust it. There are going to be probably moderate clouds, but we'll see. And we know it's going to be raining at least a little bit. So I'll go ahead and click that in, and let's go ahead and hold my mouse somewhere. So we have moderate middle clouds. Uh, we have light rain, 35 Celsius, 35 Celsius. I've goofed up somewhere. Well, let me go back and I'll make my correction here. Uh, we actually, boop, 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 boop. 
Uh, we're going to go closer to 15 Celsius. Let's see if that averages out. That gets us an average temperature of 25 Celsius. My wind state is going to be 4. Light rain, 25. Ah, now that is what I call invasion weather. Uh, normally, you probably wouldn't want to be invading or anything like that with that kind of situation. So now that we have the weather and we have the date and everything ready to go, let's go ahead and bring in some sides here. So I'm going to go ahead and bring in a Vietnam. I'm also going to bring in a neutral. Uh, usually I don't bring in neutral, but for scenarios that involve a lot of ships and a lot of subs and a lot of shipping, it makes it very, very effective. And of course, I'll also bring in China as well. Generally, when you do China, I prefer to split China up between the uh, PLAN and, you know, the, uh, of course, the naval elements, the air elements, the army air force elements, PLAF. Uh, the reason you do that is it simulates the difficulties with intercommunication between these different forces. But when you do stuff like that, it tends to make it a little bit more complicated strategically. And you'll see what I mean. So I'm going to go ahead and say uh, postures here. I'm going to go ahead and say neutral. Uh, you're considered to be neutral. Vietnam, we're going to start them right off as hostile. Uh, we're going to assume that whatever had happened earlier in the day had triggered all these sort of things. Uh, everybody knew it was coming, so there's really no surprises that this is going to happen. I'm going to go ahead and flip over to Vietnam first here. And again, uh, this is a good time to go ahead and save our scenario. We'll call it C, China, V versus Vietnam, 2022. I'm going to press the OK button there. Go ahead and save that one real quick, and we are good to go. OK, so now we've got our weather. We've got our time for a battle. Um, right now, of course, it's daytime. If you want to see just how bright that is, I can actually flip over to day and night landing. You can see it, it's not exactly what I consider to be bright. Bright's over here. This is actually still fairly dark. But if you're going to be doing an invasion of another country, uh, you're going to try to take advantage of somewhat of the people being sleeping for it just to create mass hysteria and confusion during the invasion forces. Again, uh, now we can go ahead and think about things a little more strategically here. So why on earth would uh, this giant country with plenty of resources, plenty of population, have any desire to go ahead and do anything to his southern neighbor here. Uh, those of you who are fans of history who know that it is actually not the first time in history that China and uh, Vietnam has actually had a spat. They had one pretty much right after the American versus uh, Vietnam War back in the uh, mid to uh, again, late 60s, mid 70s kind of a thing as well. So what would these be fighting over? And like I said, it's probably going to have something to do with something shipping in here. So most of the crux of this, I think, is going to be concentrating in pretty much submarine battles coupled with some surface action. I don't think there's going to be a lot of of land work, with the exception of probably targeting all the major ports, such as like, you know, Haiphong and things along those lines. So let's go ahead and pop over to Vietnam first. So the first thing I always like to do is I like to try to see what I can discover as far as uh, different things that already exist in the imports before I go running off making my own. Setting up imports takes a while for anybody who's experienced these before. So let's see here. I've got some great stuff with air defense. I've got some great stuff with early warning. We're going to need all that. Uh, what do we have as far as airports go? Uh, we have plenty of modern airports. So we have several air bases, which is excellent. We can go actually do a little bit of research online and try to determine which one of these air bases actually has what at it. But unfortunately, I do not see anything that I can use right away as far as, like I said, the Haiphong and the naval ports, which are going to be probably the primary targets of the Chinese to cripple the ability to uh, rearm and resupply kind of things like that. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go scoop up all these different air bases, and I just want to see roughly how they kind of lay out. Uh, air base there, air base, obviously it's a Soviet air base, it's a little different, um, so we probably should kind of keep that in mind. Ah, there's a naval base, yes, sweet, like yes. Uh, we have a ton, of, oh my god, I'm going to pronounce these horribly, so I'm not even going to try, I'll grab this air base as well. Load selected installations, and it looks like the most of the stuff we're going to be interested in is going to be in the north here. There's going to be some in the south as well. And the key element, though, is most of this conflict, like I said, is probably going to be isolated right in this region here. So these southern aircraft bases are probably still not a bad thing to have. Uh, popping down here real quickly, too. I believe this is, yep, Conram. But uh, the most important one for us is, um, like I said, it's going to be Haiphong. Uh, that's going to be something about uh, those who are familiar with the Vietnam War are very familiar with uh, some of the attempts to basically mine the bejesus out of it. Speaking about mining the bejesus out of it, that's probably going to be one of our priority missions that we're going to have to start planning for a little later on. I'm actually going to flip over to uh, place names real quick just to save myself a little bit of trouble. There's Halong. Oh, there's Haiphong. Just uh, see, I know my geography better than I thought I did. I'm actually going to shut off Stamen for a second here. Sentinel, I should say. I'm actually going to flip on the uh, terrain mode. Again, I'm not sure why there's a terrain and why there's a road in cities because a uh, terrain mode does everything that you needed to do and then some. Ah, there's Haiphong. This is uh, the main naval port. So what we're going to have to do here is even though it does have an airport, which is wonderful, we're going to have to build up some of the shipping elements in this region so that we can, you know, reasonably, you know, simulate what they'd probably be targeting. So I'm going to quickly go ahead and do that.
All right, we're in business. I've basically constructed it from uh, any information that I was able to kind of dig up a little bit earlier as far as this goes. Uh, the next thing we're going to be interested in, of course, is uh, populating some of the other pieces of Vietnam here. Uh, luckily for us, uh, we do have access to the early warning radar systems that was located as an import. So I'm going to go ahead and scoop those up separately from the air defense systems. Unfortunately for us, we're going to get stuck using an older system here as far as layout goes. But usually it's going to be enough to actually get us in a little bit of trouble here. Ah, uh, let's see here. Okay, that's not bad. That's not bad. That's a pretty good uh, layout. Unfortunately for us, it didn't do it in group view, which uh, complicates things from a player's perspective. So one thing I like to do is I like to quickly run around, scoop up all these different air defense sites, and I put them in their own group to kind of preclude some of the difficulties that usually comes about. Ah, uh, we have ourselves another one of those locations down there as well. Go ahead and uh, hold down the shift key. I'm just, again, like I said, I'm just going to kind of select all these different SAM batteries here, and I'll put them in their own group. As you can see, I've already goofed up once, though. Go ahead and grab that one. Go ahead and grab the SA-3 as well. Apparently, there's a lot down here. Let me zoom in a little bit. Scoop that one up. Looks pretty good. And unfortunately, when I clicked, you can't shift-click and do that. That is definitely a QOL thing that hopefully uh, one day we will go ahead and recover from. Looks pretty good. I'm going to press G. Throw them all into a group. By the way, when you make imports, folks, please make sure you just put them into a group. It makes it so much simpler. So we'll call this Vietnamese AD. Nice and simple. Just like that. I'll make sure I have made this mistake, which I've done a thousand times. Good. Good time to go ahead and uh, save our scenarios so far. Everything, like I said, is looking pretty solid. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and uh, populate the early warning radars. Again, I'm just taking advantage of things that are already in the system. If you ha have a better source for these, uh, feel free to use them. But a lot of times, you know, I don't like to spend 25 hours on a scenario. I like to spend a few hours on the scenario. Ah, they did it to us again. Mm, there we go. So we're just going to say Vietnam... EW. So the interesting thing is uh, when I was poking through all these EW radars, I noticed there's a lot of redundancy. Now, let me go ahead and zoom in and see if I can find an example of what I mean by this. Uh, that is not a good example. <laughs> Sorry about that. But what I did see when I was poking around some of the, there we go, there's a good example, is that it actually had radar sites that had multiple different copies of the identical radar basically right next to itself, which was you know kind of interesting because that basically provided you with a little bit of a kind of coverage. At the same time, it's had a little bit of redundancy, making it more difficult. Uh, the other reason, by the way, that it took the time to put all these into one group is I can turn them all off in a single press. Ha <laughs> ha. And that is uh, one of the greatest advantages that you can possibly have here. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, save my scenario again. Like I said, everything's uh, really starting to come together now. So now uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a little bit of research and figure out what we have as far as air assets at our disposal and figure out what air base they're going to be linked to. All right. Hey, we found some good information here. So it looks like in the northern uh, components, so they have Sukhoi 22s. They have several MiG 21s. I believe they do fly the BIS version or the MF. I'm going to have to go look that up. They do have Sukhoi 30s, which are the nice. That's uh, the modernized, the ex export version, second version. Uh, right in the middle, of course, we have some more uh, Mikoy and Gorevich uh, 21s. Down towards the south, it looks like you have most of your training elements. We have some Sukhoi 36, uh, 27s. There's no 36 yet. Uh, we also have L39s, which I didn't realize Vietnam actually possessed. That's actually kind of cool. Now, coming all the way down here some more sequoia 22s as well as some 30s now the problem is is this is a great piece of information but unfortunately this is not complete information we need to know roughly how many they have and again like i said luckily for us if i actually duplicate this step oh yes i use opera by the way um, nobody's ever commented on that but it's always kind of fun actually scrolling down we can actually see roughly how many of each type of aircraft they have so if i want to i can actually break this into two pieces and we can actually cross reference the two items next to each other go ahead and make this a little bit smaller so you can kind of see what's going on here Pull that one over here and go ahead and close this in case you ever wonder how I figure these things out. Now we have a really good idea of how many aircraft they have versus where those particular things are. And the nice thing is we actually know that we're dealing with fighter regiments. Now fighter regiments are fairly large. You, if you want to think about it almost like a wing, that's probably not too bad of an estimate. Sometimes, of course, you call it a fighter regiment. In reality, it's closer to squadron strength. So we're going to have to do a little bit of cross-referencing to go ahead and figure out who's going to be where. All right, starting with the uh, Sukhoi 22s, uh, just doing a little bit of research here. It looks like we have three different flavors at our disposal. We're going to go with the M, the 4K version, which is a little bit updated. Uh, we know from doing our earlier research that they have a total of 34 in service. That tells me there's probably going to be two regiments, and they're supposed to be 18 each, but again, sometimes there are accidents. So I'll go ahead and starting up here in the uh, northwest corner here. Uh, we're going to call this the 931st, 931. And uh, again, you can do fighter... Yeah, I could do FGT Reg if you prefer. Again, anything you like to do. Uh, since I like to do one of these, or if you even want to be even easier, you can do a Reg or something like that. We could come over here as well, and we could do first if you want to make these out pretty straightforward. So I'm going to go ahead and add those there. So now we have a bunch of the Sukhoi 22s up there. Now we're going to go ahead and uh, outfit the other Sukhoi 22 squadron. So I'll come in all the way down here. 
Uh, we know that the last group of those is going to be located pretty much right down here and kind of like the little uh, boot heel here. Uh, we know that the 935th is going to be here. We know this that the 937th is going to be right here. So I'm going to come right up in here. We'll go ahead and say Sioux 22s. 22. Uh, this is going to be the MK version. Uh, let's see here. We want Vietnam, of course. We'll go ahead and say that for some reason this group only had the 3Ks. Uh, we'll go ahead and stick 18 of these. Uh, we know they are with the 937. So I'm just going to type in 937. 937th. And then we can just type in reg, press add selected. And now I've got myself all of my Sukhoi 30. Oh, I just have, can't talk today. Sukhoi 22s are now all set both in the northern region as well as in the southern. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and populate all the other groups here. So uh, we don't have to kind of go ripping through everything else. All right, now we're in business. So one thing I did discover when I was kind of going through all this, trying to find all my different pieces, was the fact that, uh, for one, I had one airbase that uh, didn't seem to have anything in it after doing all my research. And the second thing I found was, unfortunately, there is no number, no number of MiG-21s left in Vietnam. So when I was sitting here kind of filling all these details out, I found that that chart actually didn't line up with the other chart, which kind of created an interesting little problem with me. So the good news is I kind of worked around that anyway, and I was able to kind of, kind of experiment a little bit. Like if I come up to CAP, you'll notice they have MiG-21. 21 bisses. Uh, if I come all the way down here, I was trying to work out exactly which one of these would be what. If I go to the airbase here, you'll notice I loaded them up with L39s, which interestingly enough are not in the database as far as uh, what we have in command. I had to borrow the ones from Thailand for this purposes. But my actual numbers for everything is actually completely accurate. So, you know, missing airplanes that had crashed, everything's been represented basically as best as I could do here. So now we have a pretty good idea what the disposition of the forces is going to be. The only thing I am going to change though is I'm going to pop up here and I'm basically going to tweak this one real quick. It doesn't have anything in it. So I'll go ahead and I'll throw in some uh, sort of helicopters and stuff like that. So I'm going to go get myself some MI-8s. We'll get the uh, Vietnamese flavor here. Oh, interesting. <laughs> well, according to this, they have, well, let me try my 17s Maybe that'll work a little bit better for me. Uh, Vietnam. Hey, we got it. So according to this, uh, they have something like 147 of these. I'm just going to do a full regiment's worth. And I'll go ahead and uh, invent a phony number here. We'll call it the 922nd Reg... Put some helicopters there just to make things interesting for us. We can use these helicopters for other things as well, you know, reconnaissance, and they do have radars on board. Hey, look at that, 35, delightful. So now we are all set as far as equipping uh, Vietnam here, as far as what its real world assets would be. We've got air defense in here. Uh, we've got our early warning in here. We've got our aircraft set up. Uh, the last thing we need to worry about is going to be the Vietnamese Navy. So uh, luckily for us, uh, if we just press the insert key and click somewhere, and I'll type in, I'll uh, go switch this over to surface ship, set the country to be Vietnam, real quick. Uh, let's pop that real fast and go ahead and set it to from. If we go down on this side of things, we can have a fairly good idea of the different types of ships that are going to be at our disposal. And a lot of times they'll actually tell you how many of them they have. So in this case, we can see we have two of these. We can see we have three of these. Uh, coming down here, a lot of these are very, very light crafts. Um, unfortunately, these are certainly not going to be the most sophisticated as far as, you know, having full destroyers and stuff like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to poke around online a little bit and see if I can find anything about the disposition of the Vietnamese Navy. Mm, this definitely required a little bit of poking. I know you're all going, you can't use Wikipedia as a source. Hey, I think it works perfectly fine. So what we did locate here is a list of uh, general equipment, and we have a general idea of where everything is located. For the purposes of this scenario, we're going to simplify these things uh, so we don't kind of stress ourselves out. We basically have access to Cam Ran, and we have access to Haiphong, plus all these other kind of spots in the middle where we can kind of work around a little bit. We got these great little pieces that told us uh, what the individual regional commands are, and you can kind of tell by looking at each one of these ships what the individual ships actually are. Like, I can tell right now that is an OSA. That's the old school OSA. I can recognize the two missile tubes here. Probably some kind of very, very light gunboat. Of course, we have something that looks like a more traditional thing. But again, these aren't the world's biggest ships. And kind of poking over here, you can kind of work sideways going over to v over to command, going over here, going over here, going over here. But the great thing is they actually gave us the number of submarines as well as, this is awesome, the different numbers to each one of those submarines. Uh, this is great news for us because uh, this means that we have the ability to go ahead and kind of load individual one of these ships directly into the system. Now, what we need to design from a grain pay perspective is do we start these afloat or do we start those in shore? Obviously, if we start them in shore, they're going to get ruined by a cruise missile strike. So as a player or as a designer, we have to say, how much of the Vietnamese Navy are we going to let loose here? In my opinion, we want to let as much of the Vietnamese Navy out as we possibly can. If we don't, what's going 
going to happen is uh, they're basically going to get one shot, and that's not going to make for kind of a boring scenario. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take all these individual submarines and I'm start loading them directly into uh, what we have there. Now, the general technique that I'm going to use for this, I'll go ahead and get everything out of the way so it's not blocking your view, is what I'll do is I'll go ahead and I'll get myself a submarine. Uh, let's say we want to do a regular good old-fashioned submarine. We should expect the Honoi, which is a kilo class. And then what I would do is I'd go ahead and take it, and I'd rename each one of these. Because remember, if you go ahead and rename something, it always lives a lot longer. So I'm going to go in here and go ahead and dial in Hanoi, which is just fun. This is the HQ182. I'm going to go ahead and backspace real quick, and we'll go ahead there. This is a Hanoi. Again, I'm not going to use I copy paste it right out of there. Press OK, and now we have one of our submarines here. And like I said, the moment you name something, it has a higher probability of lasting. As a matter of fact, we can even come in here and set the proficiency to be veteran. You know, this is the Hanoi. This is not just any kilo class submarine. So then what I would do is I go ahead and copy it. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. And then I rename each one of these individually. I then go through and set that for each ship. But don't worry, I'm not going to make you have to sit through that. All right, we're in business. So now we have ourselves an entire submarine fleet of kilos here, ready to rock. Each one's uh, fully loaded, fully crewed. Uh, each one of them, uh, like I did, I set a kind of unique proficiency here. Now, if we are being sneaky, what we'd probably do is we'd set this up so that each one of these basically protects the part of the coast that makes most sense for it. Uh, this is one of those things where you have to think about strategy because, as you know, a kilo-class submarine, while it is a pretty good submarine, is not exactly what I consider to be a high-performance submarine. Remember, our neighbors are right here, which means, uh, you know, if we're going to be dealing with attacks, we're going to be dealing with attacks basically through this vector here. Um, naturally, they would probably not want to fly through a strait, or I should say swim through a strait, or drive a boat through a strait, because that's going to be basically a, a minefield, and upon, minefield upon minefields. But... It's also a very logical place to bring an invasion force because you own this island. So that's going to be kind of an interesting thing for us. So as far as how we're going to deploy all these submarines, I'm going to go ahead and move this one around. I would probably use them primarily for reconnaissance purposes and then have them attack anything we can basically get lucky with. Now remember, these do not exactly have the world's longest range, which is, uh, makes things a little bit difficult here. So I'm going to kind of spread them out a little bit, kind of where I expect them. Obviously, we're going to need one group to keep an eye on these two groups of islands here. So I'll take the Hanoi, which is uh, definitely our kind of our, this is our champion sub right here. This is going to be an important one, I'm sure, in our scenario. Go ahead and park it, kind of keeping an eye on this part of the strait. I'll grab the Haiphong, of course, naturally. I'm going to have them go park themselves right here in this strait, probably go as deep as they can go. I'll grab the Kanoe, and I'll basically bring them down to this group of islands. Grab this one over here, pop you down there for that group of islands. The Bahrang, I'm going to go ahead and pop you down here, because again, we want to protect our shipping where we can. I'm going to go ahead and have this sub uh, basically kind of cover this distance. And now we have a nice little spread of our, our reconnaissance submarines. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and uh, save everything again. <laughs> again, this is the part of the scenario that takes the longest, unfortunately. But now we have all these nice named submarines, which like I said, it means they're going to live a lot longer. So now we're going to have to take a look at the surface assets. I'm kind of taking a look here. We basically have a group. I'll go ahead and show you so you can see what we've got here. We have a group of frigates, we have a group of corvettes, and we have a group of patrol vessels. The patrol vessels you should never hate because patrol vessels, enough of these things are more than a threat. So when I'm looking here real quickly and I'm just sort of like mentally saying, okay, so who's whom here? So we know for a fact that kind of in the north end, you've got a lot of patrol boats. We know in the middle in the Da Nang region, we have mostly those uh, missile boats, the Osas. Come down to Kamran, this is where we have the really, really big heavy frigates. Taking it, like I said, look at that picture. It's probably going to be the Gepper to the Petia. And again, the reason these are in these zones is because they're basically going to be keeping an eye on these sets of islands. All the way down here, you probably have your oldest ships. I'm just looking real quickly. I can see a Tarantile right there. And of course, we have little things like that. So kind of looking this over and kind of thinking, where's the scenario going to go? Where are we going to put everyone? I kind of see using the uh, Geppers especially kind of as the equivalent of um, almost like command ships, which gives us four groups. In each one of those, of course, I will peel them off and have like, you know, a little Petia to go with it. So basically, these would be the two sets of command ships. And then we'll support them as appropriate with the different types of uh, Corvettes in here. And again, you can see about eight. So that gets us good solid five surface action groups. So I'm going to go put those together real fast. All right, so uh, now we have all of our main major surface combatants uh, kind of ready to rock here. So basically up top, uh, we have our Petsia 2s. Uh, the interesting thing is when I was looking through these, there's actually two different types of these. There's basically the gunboat version and the ASW version. They're extremely, extremely similar as far as you know, structurally goes. But again, I had to go run around and actually track down which one of these two numbers actually meant what. So it actually worked out okay. So the next stuff we have, of course, is uh, we have the Terran tools. Uh, we had a bunch of these, actually, which I thought was actually pretty cool. The nice thing about these is they did have Styx missiles, which means we have a chance. 
Uh, coming down here, of course, uh, we have the uh, Terrence LVs. Uh, this is the HQ-375. These are actually kind of nice. They have very, very, very modern anti-ship missiles. So these are going to be our secret weapons. And down here, of course, uh, we have HQ-18s. And interestingly enough, I had to do some research here to find out what the heck this thing actually was. Uh, this is based on a South Korean vessel. So I had to actually track this sucker down. But this is all of our major surface combatants that we have at our disposal here. So I'm kind of planning, okay, how would you break these into five individual groups? You know, we have the five ships here, but we also have these two extremely effective ships that are actually have some ASW capability. So our ASW ships are going to be absolutely critical that we keep them away from the Chinese anti-ship missile batteries. Or at the very least, we need to get them close enough to the shore that we have something to hide in, because otherwise these are going to get obliterated. On the flip side, these are all very deadly surface combatants and can really, really do quite a bit of damage, which is what I'm kind of hoping to use. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and get myself some of those a little divisions of uh, kind of my osas and stuff like that. There's not a heck of a lot of those, unfortunately. Uh, you have the BPS 500 and you have the osa classes. I think we have a total of like nine or 10. Uh, to me, that's basically going to be one squadron's worth. So I'm going to put that together real fast also. All right, and now we are in business. We have all the major surface combatants. I know some folks at home are probably saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, what about all the patrol boats? And uh, what about all the submarines and everything along those lines? Um, we've got the submarines, I'm not worried about that. Uh, the patrol boats, uh, there are a lot of them, but unfortunately for us, the uh, patrol boats themselves are so darn small, um, they're not gonna survive the fact that we're at Sea State 4. So uh, that is going to be kind of a common issue we're gonna have to be kind of competing with this entire time. So they're really not worth it. One thing I did do is I did add the two uh, mine warfare vessels that we have at our disposal. So now it's just a matter of we're breaking this up into five fairly large groups. Sorry about the squeak there. So um, how are we gonna do this? So I'm just kind of taking a quick look at it, kind of getting a feel for everything. Again, I love the concept of five groups. Uh, making one surface action group is gonna be suicide because again, you're gonna be dealing with supersonic anti-ship missiles which are going to cut anything it bumps into in two. Really, the trick here is going to be about confusing the heck out of the enemy. Now, what I intend to do later on is uh, spawn in a bunch of fishing boats and things like that to kind of confuse the issue a little bit. But at the end of the day, our two most valuable assets are going to be our anti-submarine assets, as well as you know, all of these patrol vessels here that have this really, really deadly, deadly, deadly anti-ship missiles. So I think we're going to have to basically be concentrating on what kind of ranges do we have at our disposal here. Like I noticed the fact that if I click on one of these, my maximum range, let me go ahead and set this to selected unit only. I really wish it would default to that mode. I don't know why it doesn't. This is it. This is all we get for range. So unless we can get somebody close enough to it, this wet ship has absolutely no value to us at all. This one, again, very short range. Our HQ 374 is much, much, much better range here. But again, how on earth are we going to deploy this thing to have any chance against especially airborne assets, which means we're going to have to find stuff to hide behind. Our HQ 20s, of course, uh, we don't even have anti-ship missiles. HQ 851s, oh, while these things are amazing, amazing craft, they are very, very, very fast, but the super duper limited range and the fact that there's really little room to maneuver in here means we're going to have to have somewhere to hide them. Our two minesweeper vessels, I'm going to keep them as close into shore as I possibly can. There's really no reason. So really, ironically, our submarines are our force multipliers in this particular scenario. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to break these up into a few different surface action groups. I'm just kind of working this out. Five, uh, da, da, okay, we have these two. Uh, these are really just derivatives. Okay, okay, we can break one of those. Uh, if we bring one of these, we can have the ancestor I'm not breaking that up. Of course, what we could do is we could split them up into 100 different little platforms, and I hope that you can kind of get that. But again, you're going to be dealing with extremely sophisticated anti-missile batteries at the enemy's disposal. You can only hope to overwhelm them. You cannot hope to actually just kind of get them one-on-one -on -one and get that cheap shot in. The submarines will get the cheap shots in for sure. So again, we want to think about this a little bit. So I'm going to break these guys up, like I said, into two action groups. All right, I'll add a little. I'm broken into three action groups, actually four if you want to count these two. My two minesweepers, I'm going to join together and I'm immediately going to send them home. I'm not going to leave these guys out and exposed because they're just going to get nailed if I chill. On the flip side, if I send them home, this is going to get with cruise missiles. So I'm actually going to just kind of hide behind these islands over here. It's actually a beautiful island chain in here we can kind of duck behind. I've got my two major surface action groups and I have my missile row group right here. So I'm going to go ahead and I'll label them appropriately. So I will call this uh, first regional command. Regional SAG, and we'll go over here and call this one. Whoa, I always go make that mistake up there. Group, rename, sec, uh, third regional SAG, and we'll call this crazy group of gunboats down here. If I recall correctly, this would actually be technically the third. So let me call this one the fourth real fast. Fourth regional SAG, call this one the third regional SAG. And now we are in business. Okay, so we need to not put all our eggs in one basket. Otherwise, they're going to get creamed.
So the first one of these eggs, which is my missile group, I'm actually going to hide these amongst the civilian vessels I expect to be here. Now, the reason I'm doing that is because I know I could probably spread these guys out and kind of get like a cheap shot. And my first group here, this is a, basically my only one that can kind of work on its own. I'm going to kind of park it all the way around again. We don't want to get it too close. Why on earth did that just happen? Get over there. Thank you. So I've gone ahead and moved these guys. I kind of point them this direction, move them just a teeny tiny bit. And again, why on earth do you keep changing your position, sir? <laughs> uh, for some reason, that particular ship has decided to chill over there. I'm just going to go ahead and set its uh, relative bearing. Again, I can come in here and get a lot more sophisticated as far as... Uh, okay, do I have to be zoomed out in order to set that? This is something new. I've never seen this mistake before. Interesting. I'll make sure I've selected the correct ship here. Let me physically move it. Okay, no, that worked. So this is station supposed to be right there, which means it works. Hmm. You'll see something different every day, I guess. Hey, we fixed it. So this will be our one regional group. And of course, like I said, I've got my missile boat group, and now I've got my other regional group. I'm actually going to put them a little bit further south. We're going to try to kind of block those two islands here. Hmm. I think I know why that did that. Um, the reason it did that, by the way, in case you're curious, is the fact the water was so shallow that we basically bottomed the boat out. It wouldn't let me move it. So um, watch, thing. <laughs> watch out for that. Whoops. It looks like we accidentally uh, attached one of these uh, submarines as well to this unit. Get out of there. There we go. Oh, no, no. I was right. I was right the first time. Sigh. I hate it when I make goofy. I just didn't. was uh, really surprised by my sonar there. Okay. So now we've got ourselves our two regional groups. So we're going to set them way down to creep speed, way down to creep speed. And they're probably going to get obliterated by an anti-ship missile strike. But at the very least, uh, we have our submarines we can use here. And we also have our middle missile squadron, which is going to hide amongst the civilian vessels. All right, that should pretty much cover it as far as uh, setting up our assets for Vietnam goes. Obviously, we've got a lot of work to do. We have to come in here. We have to put all the different missile types in, but uh, we'll save that for another day. Enjoy.